All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another uh, special edition of, of Saber Sims Office Hours here. Uh, I'm joined with Max Steinberg here today. Max, what's going on? How you doing? Doing well, as always. Thanks for having me, Jordan. Yeah. Uh, excited to do this. Awesome. Yeah, you've had a, a pretty exciting week. It was on talking uh, to Andrew on Friday about your, your Millie Maker takedown. So I haven't had the opportunity to tell you congratulations yet. Uh, so big congrats on that. It's got to be an amazing Thank feeling. You. Yeah. Um, it's a good feeling. Yeah. <laughs> what can I say? Has it, has it really like set in yet? Does it feel real for six, six days in here now? Um, I would say still no. Yeah. And I have no immediate plans with the money. So, um, no, it doesn't really feel real, but it's great. Yeah. Obviously. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, and I know, so you were on last year talking a little NBA with me after a, a 250 K win. Um, where, where now, especially post Millie maker win, like where, where do you, where does NBA fit into you in terms of like how you see it? Uh, is it your best sport? Like, are you, is football a better sport for you? Like where, where does that fit in? I'm, I'm just curious now, like um, with the, with those big wins. I don't know. I mean, basketball is fun because it's a lot more predictive and there's, I, I wouldn't say there's more skill than football, but it's just yeah. like, there's a lot of different ways to do things. And, um, the strategy is, is, is a lot more than just like lineup building. It's about like positioning yourself for late swap as well, which is not a part of NFL. So, right. um, there's a lot more ways to get edge. So I would say, you know, theoretically it could be a sport where you can make a lot of money. <laughs> so, um, obviously my ROI in football is kind of jacked up right yeah, now, but right, uh, right. I really like basketball and I feel like I do pretty well in it. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. excited to talk about it for, for everybody watching here. Um, you know, as always, we do these streams live for a reason. So, uh, fire away at, at any questions that you have in the YouTube chat. Um, I would say YouTube chat, probably going to be the best place to, to ask questions for this stream. I did pull a couple out of discord that we'll get to here towards the end. Um, but I, I think, you know, when we talked about this, I, we had Scott on last week doing a, a hockey stream, and I think we had a good format for that where we kind of talked, you know, small picture first about what makes a good lineup and then getting a little bit bigger as we moved along and talking about building a good process. So I, I think it's a good place to start, Max. I'll ask you, like, what do you see makes a good NBA lineup? Um, in particular, you know, I think like it's a it's a sport where correlations are a little bit lower. We can see that just looking in the app and clicking on a player. We don't have like stacks in the same way of like we can describe a, a good football lineup or a good baseball lineup at least somewhat by by how correlated it is. What what are the principles of of building a good lineup for for NBA? Yeah, I mean that's interesting. I think there's a couple of just pretty standard rules. I think there's a lot of people and I think rightfully so, who kind of, and this depends on the slate, obviously, right? Because there's yeah. some slates where there's two games and there's some slates where there's 10 games, right? We literally are seeing this right now. Yesterday was two game. This is a lot more games. And so it's a little different when the slate is bigger. Um, usually you don't want more than three players from the same team. Um, some people have the philosophy they like to exclude two high salary players on the same team because... Mm -hmm. For a high salary player, you want that huge upside, and it's really hard for those two guys to score together, i.e., like LeBron and Anthony Davis, or some ways, two players like that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, a lot of it is there's not, you know, there's not like stacking, right? I mean, you can do game stacking, and that can be a little helpful, I think, for particular players. Um, you'll see some positive correlation with players on the opposing team, especially starters, um, but sometimes not. And um, it's, you know, not, it's it's not like one of those things with the NFL where stacking is just so important. So a lot of times it's just trying to play the best players and then also making a lineup that's positioned well to late swap later, given something happening or maybe just pivoting because of how the slate has played out so far. And so I think that's really important and something that's a little underrated with this type of thing. Gotcha. Uh, how do you feel about ownership in, in NBA in particular? Is is it something where you're kind of uh, willing to play some chalk or, or more on the side of fading it there? Or, or what do you think with, with ownership? Yeah, I think in general, you're going to want to eat the chalk. Um, yeah. I think usually the best way to sort of make a different lineup is just to include some low owned plays and like plays that could be in the single digit ownership. Um, 
I think there are times when you can fade the chalk and sort of the best times you can do it is where when the chalk actually has a reverse correlated bench player that is viable. Um, a lot of times you'll see this with injuries at the point guard or the center position mm-hmm. where you'll have a player who's really good value because he's now starting at point guard uh, or starting at center, but that's the only position they play. And so they have a direct backup that if that direct backup does well, there's going to be a lot of reverse correlation there. And so in those cases, I think it's can be good to really look to fade, but otherwise you don't just fade, just to fade, especially if they're a good value for a reason. Basketball uh, fantasy points are pretty predictive. Yeah. So if someone's projected to score 30, they're probably going to score like 25 to 35. And if they're really good value, then that's just going to be hard to fade. Right, right. Yeah, and I mean, you can see that just looking at the the distributions here. I, we, we've got Trey Jones as a pretty good play here. A lot of the Spurs value popping on tonight's slate, for example. Yeah. Um, and, you know, probably going to be a popular play as well. But you can see just looking at, at his distributions, he's scoring around his mean or even above his mean in, in most of the Sims. Whereas you compare this to something like baseball, uh, the chalky stack on baseball, it's, it's a much different looking curve. Right. And I guess the other factor with that is, you know, is this an early game or is this a late game and and how good is the value, right? Because if you have a player on a slate that's just kind of starved for value and then the early, they're in the early game, they're probably going to get high ownership. But if you lock that player in and then there's some injury later that makes it so you can't late swap to that player, then that makes that player a really bad play. So, uh, you know, I think one important factor with NBA is you're always thinking about how can I position myself for an optimal late swap later. Gotcha. So, yeah, I mean, let's start talking about that then in terms of of what the process looks like throughout the night. So, I mean, chronologically speaking, when when do you think the NBA process really can can start? Like when when is it safe for you to start building some lineups for the for the slate? I'd say probably like two hours before um, okay. it's it's pretty safe. Um, and it depends how many questionables there are, right? So if there's a lot of questionables, then you might want to start a little later. Um, but if there's not, you could, you'd could start two hours early. But again, keep in mind, you know, a lot of times there's news that happens within the last hour that mm-hmm. can change a lot. And you have to be willing to, you know, you, you can't get, fall in love with your lineups because chances are like 20 minutes before lock, you're going to have to rebuild them all and they're going to be very different. So I think prepping yourself before is really important. Like you just don't want to start blind building 20 minutes before, but you also just want to be building, but with in mind that you're probably going to change things later. So what is it about MBA in particular? You say like, if you start your process early, you might have to redo all your lineups 20 minutes before. Like what is it about NBA where news changing at the last second, a player coming in or out affects the slate so dramatically that you have to like almost start over? Because I think that's a common question from people that are are new to NBA, but have played DFS before. Like, you know, they're familiar with different lineups than expected in baseball or or things like that. But like why in NBA in particular, does does it have such a big impact on the slate when that stuff happens? Yeah, because... You know, in NFL, for example, right? It's mm-hmm. it's it's kind of like every player's kind of like a running back, right? We know that if a running back gets replaced with another running back, they're going to be about the same, like with a few points difference. But let's say a wide receiver, like this is something we're not used to. In NFL, you know, if um, Amari Cooper or Mike Williams, someone gets injured, whoever they're replaced with, is just straight up not going to match their production. Mm -hmm. And in NBA, that's not true. And sometimes it's actually like the inverse, right? Like some of these bench centers or bench point guards who go in the starting lineup can actually be more productive per minute than the person that was starting in front of them. And so, you know, when someone gets injured, it usually means that there's a few players who are going to get a five to six plus minute more projection. And sometimes that can be six, seven, eight fantasy points. And if that's the case, then they change from a bad value to a really good value. And you basically want to jam them in. And especially if you're late swapping, like trying to jam those players in can be really, really valuable. So. Gotcha. 
Cool. So yeah. that, that process that, that starts, you said like normally two hours before leads up right until lock. Uh, are, are you doing any kind of like research in your process, looking into anything that isn't really covered, I would say, in like just the projections or ownership projections themselves? Um, well, especially at the start of the season, mm -hmm. um, I'm going on stats.nba a lot because and that's the statistics website that the NBA hosts themselves and it has a lot of good statistics but oops we just zoomed yeah, in really sorry. close <laughs> yeah so, so stats at nba so they have a lot of what i like to look at is the team.com oh it's like a normal website of yeah. course um, <laughs> they have a lot of team <laughs> stats that i like to look at um where you can see pace stats so um let's see just go to stats on the top right or let's see Sorry, I haven't actually. You can just say see all player stats. Okay. And then we control it from there. Um, but yeah, so they basically have a lot of good stats. And so instead of players, just go to team on the top left. Nope. Down, left. Up, oh, this is so right. embarrassing. Okay, there we, there we go. That's okay. And then go to advanced. Oh, no. Uh, Here. Where? 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 Um, I'm losing you here a little bit, actually. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It might be my. It might be on my end as well. Um, okay. Give me one more time. Where's the advanced? <laughs> that next is traditional. You never <laughs> oh, time, so go to gotcha. advanced. That. Yeah. I was so okay. close. Okay. Yes. So, as you can see on the right, this has pace stats right on the right. And at the start of the season, it's interesting to look at this because obviously, you know, teams are in new situations, there's new coaches, they might be trying different things. And, you know, when we're trying to get pace, we don't have like a human being adjusting things up or down manually, right? But we're looking back at before, we're not taking into account coaches. So you can see these sort of drastic type of pace changes. And one game isn't enough because pace has to do with both teams. You know, you could look at the stand. Oh, the Lakers are really fast paced, but it's possible that they're just playing the Warriors. But it's possible they are really fast paced. So after you get a couple of games, you can look at us and be like, oh, you know, there are specific teams who have certain philosophies that are changed and they become better matchups. And so I like looking at those stats. Um, there's also, I mean, there's a lot of good stats here. I'm not going to make you go through all of them because you can play around a lot, but you can look at like, three pointers allowed thing that's something i like to look at as well because some teams they change their defensive philosophy where they're either trying to not allow three pointers a team that doesn't do this is the celtics um and they've been doing it for a while right so this is something that we're going to take into account but if suddenly you have a team like the lakers have a new coach right and they're suddenly allowing a lot of three-point attempts then I'm going to say, huh, okay, maybe this is a coaching philosophy thing mm -hmm. and the Lakers are a better matchup than Sabre Simmons giving them credit for. And I'm probably going to be adjusting guards and three-point shooters and assist guys like that. So I, I know we'll have to stay somewhat general here just because, again, it is like basically opening night of the season here, or the, right. the second night of the season, and we don't have a lot of data. But what does that adjustment then kind of look like on your end? Or like, what do, what would you go back on to Sabersim to kind of check and see, like, is this a spot that I need to adjust? Or is Sabersim kind of maybe already taking this into account? What kind of adjustment then do you think about making there? What, what does that part of the process look like? Yeah, um, well, I think with something like that, I'm just going to make the assumption that Sabersim is not accounting it for, for it correctly, unless mm -hmm. the player already is just such an incredible value. So I'll just sort of adjust their projections up and and not worry about whether um, Safe or Sim is taking this to the count or not. I'm just going to assume they're not, If especially if it's a recent change where I'm using my own judgment to sort of solidify that change more. Gotcha. And and what kind yeah. of size of an adjustment would you, would you make in that particular case? Yeah. So, you know, I think it's interesting. I think with NBA, you can go a little more crazy and mm -hmm. you're not going to go wrong because all, all adjusting their points is going to do is means they're going to get into your lineup more right right so you do a min exposure if you're not getting that particular player but sort of have the um 
intuition that they're going to be high upside or you can adjust their projection. Usually you're not going to do it by more than a few points, um, especially for the low salary guys. But um, I think you can, you can adjust people up and down and um, not worry about it too much. Right. Cause um, it's possible that, you know, if you find something that's really useful, um, you might just want to get that player a lot. So it mm -hmm. doesn't really matter how much you're projecting them up. It's just, you're trying to get them a lot. And if that requires a, a lot of point adjustment, that's fine. Um, that being said, our projections are really good. We think they're the best in the business. So you also don't have to do a lot of this. You can focus on different things, right? I personally, I've been doing daily fantasy for eight years. I love looking in this research. I like looking at stats at NBA, like clicking it on off and trying to make my own judgments about yeah. what's going to happen and how Saber Sim can be wrong. But you can make a lot of money in NBA ha literally doing none of that and focusing on ownership and late swap and things like that. There's a lot of ways you can make money. You have to find what is your edge in NBA and, and try to figure it out. Right. Yeah. No, and I, I, I think that that makes sense. I, I've always talked about you know, a, a heuristic that I like to use when I'm when I'm making adjustments to projections, which I don't always do a ton of, but but here or there I do, is ten percent of the mean projection. Um, yeah, is as kind of like a up or down. You know, if I want to make a bump on a guy or, or drop him down, I, I think that kind of helps. Um, so I think that's great. Yeah. So you mentioned late swap a couple times. I think that's obviously uh, something I've talked a lot about in in office hours here before. It, one thing you've mentioned is is not just late swap being important for some of the same reasons of of why big news can affect the slate before lock. But you mentioned late swap flexibility. Um, what does your process look like for making sure that you have flexibility to late swap uh, as the slate goes on above and beyond just actually pressing the button to do the build? Yeah. So. Um, a lot of it is going to have to do with being more conservative on players who are in the early window versus mm -hmm. and being more aggressive on players that are in the late window. And you can also sort of, if you know you're going to late swap or just have an intentional late swap, you can get pretty creative, right? So I haven't looked at the slate um yet, but uh let me just look at who are the questionable players really fast. Um there's a really good page on basketball monster um that has it so kevin herter is on sacramento let's say he mattered a lot for some reason right um which i don't think he does but let's say he mattered a lot um if um in this case you can do something where you can boost one of the shooting guards on sacramento pretty with the intention of hopefully getting that player if Kevin Herter isn't back out. And um, if he's not, then just sort of swapping into someone else, right? And trying to sort of unlock that value, right? You can boost someone like Dion Mitchell or Harrison Barnes or De'Aaron Fox or Malik Monk or something like that. And you know, if he's not out, you can just plan to late swap later. Um, and if he is, then you've gotten a lot of value there. Um, and that's something where your projection of a player, you're probably going to adjust their projection or adjust their min exposure. And the projection is not going to actually match what you think their projection should be, but you're sort of just going to take into account, okay, close out, this is what I'm going to do. And maybe this is going to be my edge. But it's it's really not that simple too. Because Max, real quick, yeah. sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I, we're we're losing you just a little. I, I think I'm 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 picking up about ninety percent of what you're saying here. Um, but okay. it looks like I don't know. Is there um, maybe are you getting like a little interference on the the internet or, or anything? No, um, I don't. Think so. It's I think maybe just my internet. Be okay, great. Which is just we're in love with it. I'm. We'll I'm we'll do we'll do the best we can. Yeah. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, okay. I didn't mean I didn't mean to interrupt you. So yeah. You, no, 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 that's okay. You're adjusting players here, kind of based on on that. You know, questionable players playing in in later games here. Um, right. I'll let you finish your thought. Yeah. So, but there's also kind of a sweet spot, right? Because you need to have options later to sort of like change your lineup around. So. Mm -hmm. You know, the Sacramento game I'm talking about, right? It's one of two late games. Right. And 
if you got to the point where you got to that game and, you know, Herder was playing and suddenly you don't have a lot of options to go around, right? There's, there's not other players to get to. So there's kind of the sweet spot where your best late swap options or the, the best options for this to happen are sort of like the middle, the games where there's like six games after it or five games after it or something where you have a lot of options still. And so those players putting them in your lineup is good in case the question player is out. And if he's not, you have a lot of options to swap into someone else. Gotcha. So this is something yeah. where you're kind of going through, you're, you're studying the slate beforehand to see who's questionable and kind of right. handling this on a case by case basis or a team by team basis of, you know, something where, um, you know, if a particular player is questionable in a later game, then you're making, making adjustments there. Um, if yeah. there if there's no questionable players playing in those later games or like a slate like tonight, right, right? The season just started. We don't have a lot of, of really questionable big impact players. Are you still preserving some additional flexibility in your lineups in case something really surprising came out? Or in that case, are you more willing to play the, the early games? Yeah. So I would say day one is sort of unique because we actually don't, aren't totally sure who the starters are. Yeah. And so um, you actually do definitely want to have flexibility tonight. You don't want to have a situation where someone we thought was starter is not the starter. And then mm-hmm. <laughs> suddenly you're, you're like, you're definitely going to have to watch that and um, you can have surprises. So um, there, there certainly will be. And um, you know, sometimes someone's not questionable and they're just ruled out. Right. We're still in this COVID time a little bit. So sometimes yeah. You know, you'll have certain things like that. I My guess is it's not, hopefully will not be as drastic as the last two seasons where you basically had to be glued to your computer. Um, and we'll get more slates where basically everything plays out before lock. But you definitely want to be prepared and you, you want to structure your lineups um, so you can late swap. If you want to, you know, choose that medium to get some edge, right? You don't have to do that. Um, but it's a way you can get a lot of edge if you play it right. Gotcha. Would you ever like set a rule forcing a certain amount of players in your lineups to come from later games to like create the flexibility, especially if there wasn't uh, a team um, that, or like a big impact player that was questionable playing late? Can we do that? <laughs> I yeah. Should, I I mean, didn't, so yeah, I mean, the lineup rules stuff is new. Um, yeah, but so are you saying like locking someone or making a rule? No, no. I mean, so we could we could do something like I mean, it, there'd be a lot of ways to do it. But we've so we have three games after seven o'clock my time, which is Mountain Time here. So we could say like take you know these games here uh, or all six teams and and create a rule and do something like I don't know. Use at least three is kind of something I've heard before, where it's like use at least three players from the late games, and and then just add all these guys, you know. You'd have to go one by one here, I think. I don't right. think we can shift click for now, but yeah. I mean, gotcha. something like that. And then, I mean, it would give you flexibility. You could turn the rule off if ultimately we ended up getting news in the Charlotte and uh, San Antonio game that ended up like kind of being the big late swap opportunity. Um, yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is a great point. You can get pretty creative with this. The interesting thing I think is is sort of the best games are like the ones that are a half hour, an hour after lock, actually, where we want a lot of players because, you know, as I said, it's it's sort of diminishing returns where there's not that much flexibility once you right. get to those later windows. But, you know, for example, like Washington at Indiana and Orlando at Detroit, like if a player from New Orleans Brooklyn is like one point worse than a similar player on Detroit Orlando. I probably would rather have that New Orleans, New Orleans Brooklyn player. Um, and so I think it's just sort of one of those things where um, you can kind of use projection as a little bit of a rating system. Um, yeah. And I think that can help a lot. You can also make a rule like that, but I think in general, I think in general more you can sort of like suppress projection or suppress the players you get from the earlier games in favor of those middle games is going to be uh, very helpful, but there's, so, there's just a ton of ways to do it. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, it's almost as if like there's additional relative value for fantasy points projected for later games, just because of that flexibility it's given you. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, I mean, it, back in the day, before there was even light swap, what I would do is I would just not actually play players from the early game um, because I couldn't light swap or with that, I was managing a lot of lineups. And if I did that, I could just build a fresh set of lineups and upload them um, a half hour after lock. And I thought there was a decent edge there. With light swap, you know, you can play this a lot more um with a lot more actual tact and, right, and right. using all the tools. And it's a lot better. You don't have to just bluntly avoid all those players. And I, I still do that sometimes for uh, the Thursday to Monday slates in NFL. When I'm playing those, a lot of times I'll still just completely X out that Thursday game, especially if it looks yeah. like a dud and then rebuild fresh at, and on Sunday morning. So um, yeah, I think yeah. that can, that can work. Um, I was going to ask too, uh, you know, we had talked a little bit about correlation here at the start. You mentioned, um, sometimes avoiding multiple players from the same team or playing multiple studs from the same team. Is, is that something that you're typically doing like with a rule and actually specifically trying to group out or are you letting Saber Sim kind of get you there on its own using the, the correlation values we have, uh, the correlation slider, the Sim diversity slider, things like that. Um, so with uh, three, if it's a big enough slate, I'll usually actually just max three players from the same team. Um, and make that a rule. For the studs, it's a little different. I mean, sometimes they're complementary. Um, you know, if you have one stud that gets a lot of offensive stats and one stud that gets a lot of defensive stats, mm -hmm. um, think like Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. I know they're not on the same team anymore, but I think that's yeah. a great example. They actually can score a lot together um, and are probably correlated. But some like Chris Paul and Devin Booker, for example, probably are not. Um, and so that's something to think about on your own, where you can set rules for particular players that you believe um, and are correlated. Or maybe there's just sort of like a intuitive thing, right? Like maybe um, there is something with LeBron and Anthony Davis that sometimes LeBron just likes to take some games off and give Anthony Davis like a lot of the work and sometimes he likes to take over and there's something like that like that's something that numbers are not going to take into account and that's when you can create some sort of rule and be like just don't give me those two players in the same team right yeah and and one thing i'll add on to you know especially for those watching that that played nba dfs with us last year and are coming back here this year uh we, we've made a lot of improvements to both the correlation uh and the way that sims handle this in the app so um earlier this summer we introduced upside correlations so now when we are actually measuring the correlations between players and building lineups we're doing so at the upside outcome for at least one of those players so you know if Chris Paul is having a ceiling game. What impact does that have on Devin Booker's production and so on? Uh, we've also improved the the sim diversity slider to better uh, bucket sims together um, in a way that builds lineups that have higher upside. So I would say two points on this because I think this is a really common question people ask about uh, for NBA in particular um, is one, I would run some builds. If you used a lot of rules for this kind of thing last year, run some builds without those at all and see how they're looking and see, you know, what, how often you're actually getting players that are perceived to be negatively correlated together. Um, and two, if you're interested in learning more about upside correlations or SIM diversity, there's a, uh, other videos on our YouTube channel that I would definitely go check out, um, including a, a long stream we did a couple weeks ago with, with Matt and Andy about, uh, the SIM diversity changes. So, um, a lot of exciting stuff there. Yeah, um, I just had one more thing to add. I, I mean, yeah. there's just so many facets to NBA, right? But um, another kind of idea of when you'd want to set a role is, you know, some of these teams have players who are like huge defensive stoppers, and you kind of don't know which player they're going to focus on. Um, a perfect example tonight is New Orleans has this guy named Herbert Jones. Herbert Jones is a huge defensive stopper. Um and it's unclear whether he's going to guard Durant, focus on Kevin Durant, or focus on Kyrie Irving. Whichever player he does not focus on mm -hmm. is going to have probably a much better offensive game. And so making a role where you don't put Durant and Kyrie together is probably more useful in a situation like this than it would given any situation. So that's something to keep in mind as well. 
And for somebody that maybe, you know, didn't have as intuitive of a sense about like who are really strong defensive players um, right. or, or things like that to look for, is there, <laughs> you know, could you, could you point somebody in a direction of like how they could do that kind of research themselves, either within Sabersim or like elsewhere? Like how, how would somebody go about kind of like learning that for themselves that, that certain players are, you know, defensive specialists or, or, or whatever? Right. Um, you know, that's actually just something that you're going to have to find articles on. Like we're, Saberism is not, we're not scouting, right? But there mm -hmm. are people who are, are actually scouting the stuff, right? And you can find them all over Twitter. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, I would say Michael Gallagher is a, a Twitter that is very good for this. Justin Fan, all these people who are like the NBA DFS experts, they'll sometimes just tweet out little nuggets where they're like, oh, you know, like this guy has been unbelievably good on defense or something like that or yeah. just good stuff. And, you know, NBA is a fun sport where there's a lot of information out there and you you can um, find a lot of research. You can find podcasts and things like that. A lot of it is free. And that's where I recommend it. Um, you know, once you get into the season, I think you're just going to sort of start finding these little nuggets, right? The reason I know that is not because I watch Herbert Jones. It's just because I found articles about Herbert Jones. I, I found resources where they're talking about how good of a defensive player this guy was. And then now if I have that knowledge and it's not going to probably change this year unless uh, somehow he falls off a cliff. So gotcha. um, it's something to just keep, you always want to just keep an eye out for strategy differences that people are talking about um stuff that has to do with actual scouting of the games where people are watching the games and are seeing particular things so there's things you want to look for because that information is just going to hold throughout the season and you can use it to your advantage gotcha gotcha um so we we had a two game slate last night we have a 12 game slate here tonight uh, how does your strategy or, or overall how you're thinking about your lineups change as the size of the slate changes? Because I think, you know, um, there's a lot of people play NFL every week and then, you know, want to want to try out NBA uh, in, in between the week once the season gets kicked off. One thing that I've always felt like really differentiates those two or one of the many things that differentiates those two is NFL. You kind of get a, approximately the same size main slate every week. A lot of times slate size isn't like having a huge impact. Big difference is night to night in NBA, how, how does slate size ultimately impact your strategy? Yeah. I mean, um, it impacts it a lot, right? I mean, with the two game slate, um, it's a little bit like showdown where you need to find a way to get a unique lineup. You need to find a way to, to, um, get a lineup that has some sort of low ownership plays. And sometimes that's going to require you to just take a stand on a particular player and, um, we get like it. Sometimes it's it's difficult to know. You have to think about a lot of times, like what bench player might get more minutes than expected. What bench player can score a lot of fantasy points in a quick period of time? Um, yeah, like right, lowering the min projection. Like on a two game slate, I was using a min projection of twelve. Mm -hmm. On a eight on a twelve game slate, I'm probably going to use a min projection of eighteen. Um, so you can do a lot of different things, um, but with a with a 12 game, you're kind of just not really worried about, you know, playing a chalky player because it's likely that they are just not going to be that chalky. You kind of just want to play the best plays. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, you know, you're always sort of thinking about no matter what the slate, like how can this guy fail? Like what could be wrong with his projection, particularly the minutes projection, which, you know, as I said, if, someone has a few minutes difference that can be a difference between someone being a great value and a terrible value. And so, you know, looking at those minutes projections of players and in sort of thinking about, you know, it's, it's hard early in the season because we don't have rotations, but using right. website that I like popcorn machine and looking how people are ro rotating in and out um, and trying to figure out, okay, how can this rotation maybe change? Um, can be really helpful. I know that might sound overwhelming. And again, you know, I literally go through every single possibility of every single way I can have an edge. I'm a professional. I spend hours on this every day. Yeah. Right. And that is not a requirement to make money. Like a lot of times the best thing you do is find your edge, whether it's in projections, ownership, or late swapping 
and try to milk that for as much as it's worth and, and use that to your advantage. But, um, you know, you, I, I will just emphasize this, like, you don't need to like, look at these outside resources or, or figure these things out for yourself. As long as you're using some sort of strategy somewhere that you yeah. know is going to add to your edge. And yeah. And I, I think it's worth noting that, I mean, just building with default projections, default settings on, on SaberSim alone is going to make you so much further along in the process right. than somebody having, you know, basically just printing out cash lineups from other right. another traditional optimizer. Um, for somebody that maybe kind of wanted to start taking steps towards doing some of the research that you're doing, looking into those rotations, but maybe is overwhelmed by the idea of looking at 24 different teams on a 12-game slate, right. is there kind of a, a like, a way that you maybe would say, Hey, like this might be a good, you know, single team to look into or, or a single game to look into. Like, is there any particular reason why, why, you know, there might be more value looking into one situation versus another? Totally. So, I mean, I would say the first thing is just build, build lineups, right. Mm -hmm. And see what SaberSim's giving you. And, you know, if you have a particular team or a particular player that you're getting a lot, then that's a situation where, you're going to want to focus on that team or focus on that player. Um, another thing is you can look at who's the questionable players, right? Because if you have, have a question, so for example, like on this point, San Antonio, right? We get two San Antonio players right off the bat who are mm -hmm. highest owned players. So then you can be like, all right, why? What's going on with this team? Who's on the roster? Who's getting projected minutes? And look at that situation and say, okay, this is a team to focus on. And if I spend 10 minutes trying to figure out what's going on here and what could be a mistake in possible, possibly in the minutes projections here, then that's going to be really useful. Another thing you can do is just look at the questionables, right? Uh, especially in the late games where we're not going to get um, there. And great, looking at minutes especially is great, right? Because if you look at the minutes of everyone on the team, you can sort of mm -hmm. see like, okay, who are the starters? Who are the bench players? who might get into the game like a lot of times you're going to see on these teams where there's going to be players who are projected at five minutes and usually when that happens you have a situation where they're either going to not play at all or they're going to play like 10 minutes and we're sort of splitting the difference and when you have a situation like that um it's good to sort of research like is this player actually going to play right or not, right? You can literally Google some news on this player and see if the coach has a quote where he's like, I really like this player, or you can't find that at all, because that can be the difference between the player playing or not. Um, so yeah, sorry, you yeah. want to say something? No, 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 that's a really good point. I mean, a guy that, so I ran some builds earlier this morning and uh, this Jake Laravia Le guy, um, who I, <laughs> I've actually never even heard of, was popping in some of my builds here earlier today. And I actually had a little note uh, here written down that I, later today I was going to just like Google his name and just kind of see like what's out there on him because right. I, I, I have no idea who he is. But I mean, um, obviously, Min Price projects for like a decent value play along with some of these other Memphis guys right now. So right. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a great approach. I, I've always mentioned too, you know, on on office hours before that those those questionable players like just by virtue of like being questionable, create some uncertainty in, in projections. Um, and that like, that can be uh, just a decent way of like, you know, looking into that, right? Like it, it seems like a lot of the reason why we're getting uh, Memphis value tonight is because of this Dylan Brooks situation. Right. So that, that kind of points you in the direction yeah, of that's... looking a little bit closer to, to Memphis and like what's going on here, who might get some minutes Great. there. Great point. Um, yeah. The, yeah. The other, exactly. Like, the other thing I was going to say is just looking at questionables and being like, okay, you know, we're projecting this questionable player in. If this questionable player is out, what is going to happen, right? Um, and that could seem kind of daunting, but, you know, something that I do a lot on slates is I'll just go to basketball reference and just look for games when this player was out, right? So, um, um, if you look at Dylan Brooks, for example, right, you can look at his game log from last season and it'll be very clear, um, why, when he was out, right. Uh, you look at 21, 22, you scroll down, you can see games where he's out and this is going to be a little less useful, um, because, you know, this is last season, they have a completely mm -hmm. different roster, but you can see who they started, who they played a lot. Um, as the season goes on, this is going to be something you're going to do a lot, 
right? And you can see, okay, does Saber Sims minute projection match up with what it seems like what happened last year, what, what's going to, what uh, could happen when the situation arises. So um, that's something that I'm looking at a lot as well as just trying to figure out, okay, this questionable person is out, what has happened in the past when that's happened, and then start adjusting players' projections or min exposures or whatever based on that, trying to get those players more. Gotcha. Yeah, no. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think this can even be like, not just like for the point of making an adjustment or with the goal of making an adjustment, but sometimes this can just be helpful as a way to just explain what you're seeing. I, you know, I, I think there's questions sometimes where people run a build and they think like, why am I getting 64% John Conchar or something like that? And then you can right. kind of rebuild like that understanding there of like, okay, you know, let's go through. So we're seeing Dylan Brooks is out, right? Uh, you know, what happened last year when Dylan Brooks was out? Well, John Conchar is getting 19 minutes, right? Where are we projecting John Conchar's minutes projections tonight? You know, what does the the changes to this team now look like um, right. this season? And, and you know, maybe you take a stand here, right? We have John Conchar at 28 minutes. There is uncertainty in a, in a, in day two of the NBA season on a team with an injury. Like maybe that's a stand where you're, you think somebody else is going to get some more minutes, but I think this can just be a helpful way of kind of, you know, building this, this intuition up. Right. Uh, that being said, you know, his backup seems to be a player that we've never heard of. Exactly. So right. maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe that 28 minute projection is actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. <laughs> the Grizzlies right. look um, kind of thin a little bit this year. I, no, I feel they, like they were a deeper good. team last year. Um, weirdly. Well, they uh, might but... have a lot more players out than just that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So <laughs> it's a, it's something interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, there's there's a lot of places to look, but in summary, basically, right, is focus on the players you're getting and mm -hmm. you're going to get, and focus on those teams, and focus on the teams where there's questionables. And you don't have to go through every team; that's almost completely pointless. Like you could go through every player in Detroit, and you, none of them could. You could have zero chance of getting any exposure to them, right? So, yeah. Um, which is actually not true because I think we're getting a lot of Cade Cunningham, which makes sense. Um, but, you know, there's going to be particular players where it just straight up is not worth looking into them, and that's totally fine. And, you know, you, you just want to try to add as much value as you can. You know, if that's just looking at a couple situations and then um, making a difference that way, that's great. If that's looking at a lot of them because you have a lot of time, that's going to be very helpful too. But you know, if you can take what we're giving you and add a little value to that, that's going to probably equal profitable lineups. And uh, that's really all you should be worrying about. Um, you had mentioned briefly a, a minute ago, showdowns. Um, do you feel like there is an edge in playing NBA showdowns? <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ask. I never play them. So okay. I don't know. I mean, it, I think it's interesting. Um for sure. Um, but it, it's really, the strategy is kind of unique. You see a lot of people who will literally play these guys that will only play in a blowout. Um, and that mm -hmm. can be actually a good strategy, but that's going to take some manipulation of the Saverson tool in order to get them. Um, and, you know, that strategy is not going to work a lot. There's other strategies, but I just don't really play them unless it's the playoffs and the prize pools are really big. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think uh, this is going pretty quick. We're already 45 minutes in here. I see there's been quite a few questions that have trickled in into chat. So I think it'd be a good opportunity here for us to bounce over uh, and, and touch on some questions here. Um, so um, let's see uh, real quick. So from Roscoe said, Hey, Jordan, does the rule uh, of more entrance, the better and below $3 still apply in all sports is NBA different uh, in MLB and NFL having trouble with uh, having a good ROI. I mean, I I think, you know, for the NBA standpoint, Max, I'd just be kind of curious, like on your stance, I know you're probably up there, you know, playing maybe larger field contests than, than this, the $3 stuff, but like, what would you recommend to a beginner in terms of thinking about their, their contest selection um, for, for NBA? Um, I think it's the same as we recommend this. You want to play low stakes. You want to avoid the good players. You want to avoid mm -hmm. people who are late swapping because you are going to be late swapping and you're going to have an advantage on them. And that means lower stakes, bigger field tournaments, right? Um, it's a little different 
then football, right? There's a little less variance. And so um, you're going to have an expectation of at least, you know, if you, if you play things right, that you're going to have a, a little higher chance of cashing. I mean, it's still a tournament with, you know, big money for first, but you know, you still want to do that. You want to play the low stakes. You want to play a lot of lineups and you want to play them across a lot of tournaments. And that's going to be your best bet. You know, um, there, there is not value in going to the higher stakes because I, I don't even know what the logic is. They're just going to be better players who are going to be late swapping more, who are going to be very experienced. And that's going to be a lot tougher to beat than um, $3 or less. Yeah. And I, I did record a, a video here that this is really applied for football or um, the example I'm using in the video is the NFL lobby. But uh, I would check this out, Roscoe, if you haven't seen this yet. It sounds like maybe you you watched one of our older contest selection videos. We have made a couple changes this year um, with that. I, I checked this video out. Uh, a lot of the the lessons in here or the five rules can be applied to the the NBA lobby um, and, and particularly at the lower stakes. So, um I think it's a, a, a good watch there. Um, there was a question here as well from um, Rogue in in Discord. It's kind of a two-part question. I can touch on the first part. Rogue said, uh, are group rules and aggregate rules still honored when running late swap builds? The answer to that is yes. Um, but second question here, and, and Max, I'm curious your take on this here, um, says, uh, what would you guys recommend to ensure only one to two low minutes slash low points players are in each lineup, thinking about setting a minimum minutes filter instead of just a points filter or using a rule that says average minutes must be at least X. Max, your thoughts on, on handling this with like rules or, or filters or anything like that? Um, well, I would say that you definitely can filter just by projection, right? I think a good rule of thumb is 18 DraftKings points um, or 15 or something like that is going to be good. Um, I think we set the default as 15, but that's sort mm -hmm. of like splitting the difference between games. Like a 12-game slate, like 18 is, is probably low enough. Um, so I would say that if you wanted to filter further, the players you don't want, if you really are saying that is you want you don't want these higher minute low fantasy point per minute players right so um pj tucker have, is the yeah is pj tucker exactly, is a great example right? yeah although you know if he gets like 35 minutes that's, that's a totally different thing but yeah right you can have these players who um they might be decent from a value standpoint but in general those players and i'm talking generally uh there are mm -hmm. going to be exceptions those players are going to be lower upside um you know, that being said, like I, on the flip side, if you have a low projected minute player that has high fantasy points per minute, then those players can have random pretty good games. And, um, you know, those are the players that you're probably, you probably might have a lower average projection, but I won't be looking to exclude, especially on a two or three game slate. So mm -hmm. um, I think usually you can just cover everything by just having a minimum point output and that's fine yeah and, and i would say too i i think the better approach here would be rogue to, to build lineups first and spend some time studying your exposures you know look at look at the, the stack combinations you're getting as well to see like where you're getting situations where maybe you are playing a lot of players from the same team the actual individual lineups themselves like I, and and then seeing, you know, is there a combination of players or a particular player that is low projected or low minutes projection on that night that's popping a lot that you need to go spend a little bit more time looking into and then potentially setting a rule. I, I think looking for a broad heuristic rule of thumb to, to limit low minutes players or low projected players is going to lose a lot of the nuance of like slate context, the size of the slate, all, all that kind of stuff. I, I, I worry, like, I, I don't feel like there is actually an answer that I would give to this question. That's like, I would set this rule and use it all the time. Yeah. You just made me think of something though. Like everything you can do um, pre-build, you can basically do post-build, especially just using filters. So um you know, you don't need to set a rule pre-build to then eliminate a player from your lineup pool, right? If you right. scroll down and you see someone with 10% or 5% exposure that you think is low upside, like, I don't know, John, I don't even know who John Williams is, but let's say Monty Morris or something. 
um, or anyone. You can just yeah. zero out there or uncheck them, and there we go. They're not in your lineup anymore. So, and we're building you. You can build a fifteen hundred pool of lineups, right? So that's ten times the amount of lineups that you're building mm -hmm. for, or depending on how many lineups you're building. And so, you know, removing these lineups, it's like, all right, great, just remove lineups with that players. It's not going to affect things that much. Um, so I would just recommend doing that too. Is anything you want to do pre-build, you can just do it post-build, right? Yeah. Because I think, I, yeah, sorry. I was just going to add on to that. The builds now with our most recent build speed improvements are, are so fast <laughs> yeah. that like it's almost just as easy now to like figure out the guy that you didn't want showing up. In this case, we'll just use Monty Morris as an example. Go back, uncheck him and build another 1500 in like 10 right. seconds and then right. iterate from there um, can, right. can be another approach. Yeah, I mean, I would say we encourage you to adjust things, build, adjust things, build, but you really don't want to just do things blindly, right? Because you could build and you could eliminate a player that because of the structure of the slate, you know, you're getting them a lot for a reason, like you need that value or right. something like that. So you don't want to just eliminate that player and then get a way worse player because you thought, oh, this guy's low upside, but he really is actually your best choice. So make sure that you're building to sort of confirm your prior, which is, right. you know, I don't like this player and I'm getting him like 2%. I just don't want him 2 to 5%, so just eliminate him. And that's totally great, but make sure you're building to check your thesis. There are a couple questions here about utility positions here. First, I'll, I'll answer this one from 12-pack. Uh, would you consider only using later games in your utility spot from certain slates? That will happen automatically in the lineup building process in SaberSim. At, like, I guess it won't necessarily guarantee that a player in the late game is included in the utility spot in every lineup, but it will always be the player playing in the latest game for that given lineup in utility. Um, Matt has a question about like limiting positional eligibility there. Are you concerned or, or do you look at all about what positions you're using in your utility or flex spots? Um, so it is interesting because it's not because of a point projection thing, but it could make sense to do that. Well, actually, no, I don't think it does make sense to do that. Um, if it has to do with positioning for late swap, I would say yes. Otherwise, no, I, I don't I don't limit positions in my utility slot. Yeah, and I, I think even it, like you hear this often for NFL, no no tight end in flex kind of stuff. I, I think that is even a little tenuous of like if that's actually a good thing to do. I I don't think it matters at all in NBA. Um, I can't think of any reason why like I would want to avoid a certain position from being in the utility. Right. If they're a good play, they're a good play. Right. I mean, you know, point guard and center are usually the most high fantasy point per minute uh positions so mm -hmm. i could see someone making the argument to say you know i only want centers and point guards and you actually look You're actually getting that a lot mostly, of centers yeah. and point yeah. guards right um so that's the benefit of saver sim is we're we're taking this into account we're not just spewing you off op projection optimals um we're actually looking at simulation data but yeah so you know just as a general thing i think you know it, it wouldn't be like the worst idea in the world to do that but you don't need need to do it but if you're building on your own like that's something to keep in mind interesting question here from cameron uh is this a type of slate where i should late swap before every game and when are the best times to late swap um you know especially for somebody that maybe isn't as familiar with with the nba or like when news is breaking or how impactful that news is would you recommend somebody basically take this approach and just swap before every game to, to make sure they're not right. missing something or well so i think cameron actually is um I think the last thing he's saying kind of makes the point of the emotional experience of doing that, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you choose to do that, your lineups are going to change every time and you're kind of going to see how they've changed and it's going to really hurt if they change in the wrong way. There's a good chance that that might happen. There's also a good chance that will be in the other way, but human beings tend to notice when it happens for the worse. Um, yes. So you're sort of going to have to get used to like, late swapping and then it's screwing you right and all and then just like completely discounting it when it actually helped you tremendously um or helped you and you just didn't notice um 
I think there are a lot of people who use SaberSim who late swap every time. Um, I usually only do it when there's some sort of significant difference. Um, so if you don't feel like you can track what is a significant difference or not, you can late swap before every lock. You really don't have to do that. I think as a general point, you kind of want to at least check before the middle time of game start before like a big chunk of game start. Um, I think tonight, if I remember correctly, um, it's just a half hour before lock is when the yeah. biggest chunk of game. So just like checking back and seeing if anything's changed and it has, then okay, that's that's something light swap. But if it hasn't, you really don't have to do it. And I, I, I love this basketball monster dashboard as well. The player news section, just kind of keeping an eye on this in particular will give you yeah. kind of like a, a beat on like what, what news is breaking combined with the sim alerts and Saber Sims discord. You can kind of start to put the puzzle pieces together of like, Oh, you know, this guy got ruled out and then we ran a sim and like, maybe now that that means I need to, to do a swap there. Right. Um, interesting question here from Mark as well. Said if fleet swapping by hand, is it better to change the same player in every lineup or should we add variants? Um, I, I would, I would first, you know, say that, you know, I, I don't think you should really need to have late swap by hand, um, <laughs> right. using, I, I think you will get a more effective and more efficient late swap using the, the late swap tool on SaberSim. Um, I do think there is an interesting variance question overall here of like, if we get an 8x value player that opens up because of news that broke, how comfortable should we be getting a ton of exposure to that guy? Like, do you are you worried about spreading out and diversification during your your late swap process? I think you need to be really willing to get like 80, 90% of a player if it opens up like that. Um, and just taking that risk because the risk is lower than you're used to. And um yeah, it just, it can be really valuable to get that player, right? Um, if you're, for example, like if you were around five minutes before a game started and um, some very key players ruled out and opened up a ton of value, your that player's ownership is probably not going to be a lot because there's just not that much time for others to process that news. In that case, I... I would just want to like overexpose myself to the player yeah. and try to get him a hundred percent because that player just has so much edge on the field. And I would just be willing to take that risk. Yeah. Really good point. And the, the other thing I'll add there is, you know, a lot of times when you're late swapping, you probably can't even get like whatever the optimal amount of exposure is to that player anyway, because of the positional like issues of like some players in your lineups are, are going to be locked and they're going to be taking up positional spots and they're going to be taking up salary. And you know, if there's an elite value play that opened up that you should get a hundred percent of, you might only be able to get 75% of them because of the way that your lineups are already set up, which is right. why that late swap flexibility thing you're talking about is so important. But like, I, I agree. I typically am more concerned about like how much of this elite play can I get as opposed to how much can I diversify when it comes to, to right. NBA late swap. Yeah. Totally. Um, good, good setting expectations question from Shadowhawk. Is it common to end up with lineups that don't make any money at all? Am I doing something wrong if that's happening a lot? Yes, it is very common to end up with lineups that don't make money at all, especially if you're playing a big tournament. Um, if you're playing cash, which I actually don't do, I'm just straight up a tournament player, but people make money playing cash. You're obviously one going to want to have a, a line where you make money like 55 to 60% of the time. Um, or hopefully 60%. Um, if you're playing a tournament, you know, you're going to have the majority of your lineups not make any money, and that's totally fine. Your lineups are also going to be correlated on a night-to-night -night basis, right? If one of particular player you had a lot of exposure of on does really poorly, you're probably going to lose a lot of your money. If that player does really well, you're probably going to make a lot of money. So um, luckily, NBA, there's, game, there's games every day. <laughs> And so the positive is it's not like NFL. You don't have to wait a week to try to uh, make that back. Um, so it's kind of, you can tolerate a little more variance in NBA. But yeah, you're, you're not doing anything wrong if you lose multiple nights in a row or a given night or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think there's even just a, like a mathematical, like 20% of the field gets paid out in most of these GPs. So, I mean, your baseline expectation is that 
eighty percent of your lineups are going to be outside of the the cash line. Um, right. You know, obviously with some flexibility there, night to night. So um, definitely not doing anything wrong there. Which is why bankroll management, contest selection, these things are are things that we preach so heavily here because it's it's a it's a marathon and it's it's not a sprint to to be successful playing DFS. So. Um, Edward asked a good question here on the heels of the late swap conversation. Um, as the night goes on, should we be turning rules and lineup rules and things like that off? Um, your, your thoughts on this, especially if you've set like some some rules throughout the night. I think um, the answer is pa is can be yes. It depends on what the rule is, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think in general you should lean on turning them off. Um, but again, that's something where if you have enough time and you're familiar enough with it, our tools, you can kind of do something where you late swap and just see what happens and and say, if something looks weird or maybe uh, you're getting a player that you're like, huh, um, why, why am I getting that player? It might be because you have a rule that is preventing you from just like jamming in the players that you actually should be jamming in at this point. And it might be valuable to turn them off. So yeah. Um, you know, I would recommend maybe doing a late swap with, with your rules and a late swap turning them off and seeing the difference and just um, assessing whether or not the first swap is better or the second swap is better. Yeah, and I was going to say, you know, in particular, if you are if you're running into an issue where late swap your late swap build isn't even building at all, like you're having you're not getting enough lineups, it is possible that you've set a rule that because of positional eligibility and salary restrictions like we just can't we simply can't late swap your right. lineups at that point so uh good situation then to just the nice thing here with this new rules dashboard too is you can just uncheck these you won't lose these forever or anything like that you can just uncheck them run that late swap build uh and you should be good to go so yeah i was gonna say especially with exposures that's something to look for too because you can have a min exposure to someone where at this point you actually should not have a min exposure to them or a max exposure to them so just make sure you're looking at those as well um, yeah. And it was a question here. I, I think people maybe saw me looking for this on, on the screen a second ago. Uh, <laughs> Skull said, what does the Saber Sims MBA model include then? Um, we did a stream last year with the, um, the models team with, with, uh, Eric and, and Will talking quite a bit in depth about what goes into our MBA model. Um, I will dig that up and pop that into the discord later and also uh post that up it's that time of year i i need to feature the uh, mba stuff back up on the youtube channel so we'll get the mba stuff uh front and center back on youtube and i'll pop that link into the mba channel in in discord later so um i will also say i mean our nba model is, is very sophisticated right is you know just like everything we do we're actually simulating every game and in an nba we do it possession by possession we have mm -hmm. you know rates for everything like assist, assist rate three point rate for each player like taking into account rotations like we're doing a lot of stuff and so and i think that's one of the reasons that our projections end up being so good is you know you can say okay this you know this team has a certain pace this team has a certain pace this player has a certain three point rate and try to do projections that way but if you're actually simulating out the game you're going to get a much more accurate average projection and especially a way more accurate upside projection um than if you're not doing it that way so i think you know it is a possession by possession simulator and yeah. we do a lot of work to make sure the rates for everything on this given possession, given those players, the players on the floor and the players' individual rates, like assists, two point, three point, rebound, et cetera, are really good. And that creates uh, really good projections. And, and I'll add on to that too, you know, I, I, going even beyond just the projections that we have, the data from the Sims themselves are used directly when it comes time to build lineups. So we're actually pulling right. from sim outcomes and correlations from the sims and building lineups from there. Um, the, the, it is true that we have very good average projections as a result of our sims, uh, but it, it, the sims themselves are actually used in the lineup building process, which is uh, a huge, huge value add there. So, um, Aaron asks a uh, single entry guy, how do you feel about just using one lineup in a well, now I'm confused. In a multi-single entry contest. Um, I think he means in multiple single entry. I'm I'm just gonna interpret it this way. Yeah. Um I you know, I think in NBA more than any other sport, this can be more okay because it's much easier to manage one lineup than multiple lineups. But um that's only if you kind of want to get 
really micromanage you with how you're light swapping. Um, luckily with our light swap tool, like we're going to allow you to manage that as much better and that's going to lower your variance. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in NBA, just because light swap is so important, it's a little more viable to just put one lineup in a bunch of single entry contests. But if you do that, you're going to have to eat a lot of variance. So you're going to have to be confident in, in that actually helping you um, late swap better. Yeah. And I think that's the main point is like, there's nothing wrong with wanting to just play a single lineup. I know that there's a lot of people out there that just kind of want to have their guys that they're rooting for. It does dramatically increase your variance. In fact, we've proven it. Whereas we have a whole series in our behind the Sims uh, podcast where um, Eric on the team did this, this detailed contest simulation analysis of, of the impact on variance of playing, you know, just a single lineup or just playing only single entry contests and things like that. And it, it has a big impact on, on, on your swing. So I would say, you know, you should, if you want to play just a single lineup, understand that that increases your variance and scale back the bankroll that you're investing in a given night. Um, because you can, you can safely invest more of your bankroll on a given night by playing more lineups. Uh, so, um, it, another question for Mark is, is it sometimes good to play questionable players as a way to fade or, or, or get ownership leverage? Yeah, I mean, I think the positive about having a good late swap tool is you can just straight up play a questionable player. And if he doesn't play, you can swap him out. And if he does, you don't yep. need to do anything. Right. Um, I think especially um, when that player is kind of like middling value, they can sort of have their ownership depressed a lot because of that questionable tag. So I think it can be valuable to play them for sure. Yeah, especially, you know, late. A, a good player, like a stud player playing in a late game with a questionable tag, a lot of times people will just, you know, say, I don't want to deal with it. Uh, and the, right. the ownership will come in a lot lower on that guy uh, than, right. than expected. Right. Uh, on the, the subject of, of research, I know you had name dropped a couple Twitter accounts. Are there any uh, NBA right. podcasts that you think are, are good for, for research? Yeah. Um, Established a run has a free basketball podcast. That's literally like eight minutes every morning and uh it's like i michael gallagher i listen to it a lot it's like such a quick listen and the positive is he actually watches like coaches press conferences so he can give you very good information with that um that's honestly basically the only one i listen to just because it's really good value it's free and it's like eight minutes so uh that would that would be one that i recommend cool Benjamin says, uh, have you guys talked about geometric mean and NBA? Um, I think there's a lot of things that this can mean. I assume this is particularly about ownership in particular. Um, we've touched on ownership a little bit, but I mean, Max, do you, I guess we've talked about rules from the standpoint of late swap flexibility and correlation specifically. Are you interested in any ownership focused rules uh, with, with your NBA lineups? Um, well, I'm probably not because I usually am adjusting projections, um, and trying to get some of these low owned plays naturally. So I don't mm -hmm. have to worry about it, but you know, the reason that geometric mean is helpful is because if you, if you take some ownership, um, it will value something like having two 30% ownership plays, um, the same as having a 50% ownership play in a 10% ownership play. Yeah. And those are actually way different. The 50 10 is, is much better for your lineup. Like having a low ownership play is just really, really helpful. Um, it makes your lineup a lot different and it differentiates you from the field. So um, that can be really helpful. I currently, I mean, all this stuff is very new, right? So I currently don't have a process that incorporates all the stuff you don't need to incorporate all the stuff. Yep. I think our ownership fade slider is actually very clever um, with the way it incorporates it. It's not just some ownership. It's taking the differences with position, positional differences with ownership and incorporating it into the bills. Um, and so it, it actually is like a pretty sophisticated way of doing that. So, you, you know, you using that slider means you're probably not going to have to worry about this, but um, if you really want a sophisticated process, which again, you don't have to do, you can incorporate these things and it might help a little bit. Yeah. And, and I'll default to kind of a, a similar answer that I've given with these rules questions a lot is rather than starting with the rule and thinking, what rule do I need? 
build the lineups first and then, you know, take an ownership based angle when you're studying these, right? Like, look, you know, what, do, what, what do the lineups look like? Am I getting low owned plays here without doing anything at all? I mean, this first lineup here, you know, it's a 12 game slate. We're getting, you know, multiple sub 10% owned guys, Gordon Hayward, Brandon Ingram, guys that, that have upside and, and that's the ownership fade slider at, at work here. So I would say, you know, start from looking at the lineups and asking yourself, am I not getting enough ownership fade for what I want in my process first, then building a rule that potentially can help you add that as needed, um, I think is a, a better way than, than trying to come up with the, the heuristic first. So, yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, usually my philosophy with rules is I make rules for things that I don't want instead of things that I do want. Right. Um, so it's just sort of like, you're just trying to like trim the fat off of everything that you just don't want. Uh, you mentioned you mostly play tournaments uh, or only play tournaments. Any thought on if there's an edge in NBA cash games or, or worth, you know, people dipping their, their toes in there? Um, I think there is an edge in cash games. Um, it's going to probably require you to late swap. Um, I think that's going to be part of the edge and the edge is smaller. And so um, I don't do it but I think there can be an edge. And uh, so if you want to play it and try to figure it out, that's great. Uh, and I'd say there's more, probably more edge than NFL. You Really? You think there's a, a bigger NBA cash edge than NFL cash games? I guess it depends on who you're playing against. I would say if you're playing low stakes, it, it probably is because you can sort of make bigger mistakes. Yeah. Um, in high stakes with NFL, it's probably easier because you can it's like easier for a smart person to make mistakes where in basketball, it's easier for a, a dummy to make mistakes. <laughs> so. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Um, Skull asked an interesting question. I, I definitely have a take on this, but I'm interested in hearing yours. If correlation isn't that important in NBA, how is Saverson spitting out better lineups than a traditional optimizer? Um, so Yes, I would say correlation is not that important, but luckily our optimizer does not just build on correlation. We're talking about real sim optimals. And the, the benefit of that is, is actually upside, right? Is with NBA, you know, the reason that average projection is not that great is because some people with the same average projection have completely different uh, ranges of outcomes and upside profiles. And because we're actually building from buckets of simulations that we're creating, we're going to give you players that just naturally have more upside and lineups that have more upside as a whole. And rather than an optimizer, that's just going to build on averages or if, unless you're manipulating projections a lot, maybe it'll do something different. Um, but it, it definitely is giving you, I think the best thing with Safer Sim is it just gives you a higher floor to work with, right? You can do all the things that everyone else is doing with traditional optimizer, and that's going to mm -hmm. improve your lineups. But we're just going to give you a better baseline because we're going to give you higher upside lineups. And whether that has to do with correlation or not uh, depends on the sport. Um, but in, gen in NBA, we're at least going to um, have a really good idea of what these players' upsides are, and uh, our build process takes that into account. So it's going to give you better lineups. I agree. And I'll, I'll add on to that by saying, you know, one, correlation is less important in NBA, but it isn't unimportant. And I mean, we still calculate correlations between players and still use that data when it comes time to build the lineups. Uh, I'll also mention too, and this is a different answer than I've given to this question when it's coming in the past, but we have now by far the fastest NBA optimizer on the market. I mean, it is, we, we've run a couple builds here on stream already today. This is even with a couple of the random rules we've set here. Um, I mean, you're building 1500 lineups in just a couple seconds in a sport where speed is like by far one of the, the most important things because of how late news breaks. Like, even if you don't care about all the other wonderful things that make Saberson great that Max just talked about, there's a value to just having your lineups get built like ridiculously fast here. We also have a really powerful late swap tool that takes in that information into account as the slate is changing throughout the day. So like, I, I think in particular, we've, we've had a big push this year to add that speed and, and, and make sure that we're, we're getting those lineups built as quickly as possible. So I think that's, that's a value even for people that aren't even as concerned about Sims and, and correlations and things like that. So, um, I wanted to ask, uh, and, and Max, I mean, I'll, I'll just ask you, I, I know we have a lot of questions here. We've got a very busy uh, stream here, which is awesome today. How are, are, are you, you willing to stick around and keep 
uh, rolling through questions here. Cool. Okay. Um, I, I wanted it, to, but yes, last. <laughs> I, 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 it looked like that was an affirmative yes answer yeah. based on your your face. So I was like, okay, let's yeah. let's just roll with it here. Um, yes. <laughs> come on. Great. Um, uh, real quickly, I'll, I'll touch on this one. Clint said, um, <laughs> uh, recommended daily wager percent for NBA since it has less variance than NFL. You know, I I would say if you've watched the other contest selection videos, the profit plan stuff, I I still feel like that two and a half to five percent of your role range is kind of the right place to be. I mean, Max, is there a, do you really change the way you're applying your bankroll in NBA versus NFL versus these other sports? No, I, I don't. And uh, I've always been more, even more conservative of that. So um, I think what you're saying is great. Cool. Uh, have you experimented with the main uniques player post build here? Uh, new feature changed yeah. this week. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's great. Um, I think, I mean, as, as Matt has pointed out and, and, you know, maybe someone's listening to this doesn't under, don't, does not understand why we're doing it this way, but you know, if you do min uniques before you build what that's going to end up happening, like if you three min unique, it's just going to make the builds towards the end of the build process get pretty like diverse just because it's forcing some weird stuff and it's just not an optimal way to do it i mean it's hard to sort of understand unless you actually have created a builder or know how it works which i actually haven't but i i do understand the process is you know it, it just makes it so it, it doesn't build the lineups in a way that is great but if you apply it after you build the lineups now we're just talking about lineups that were built efficiently and correctly and then applying it for yeah. diversification. And so I think it can actually be really helpful to diversify your lineups. Yeah. And I would highly recommend if you guys haven't tried this out yet, experimenting with this and just seeing like the impact as you, what the way I, I typically do it is it's starting at one by default. It, see the impact uh, on your individual player exposures and what rank of lineups you're looking at in your pool as you slowly increase the minimum number of unique players. And you can kind of see you will get more diversified and extend further into your pool as you are forcing additional diversity between these lineups. And I think because most lineups, you know, in I would say the top third to top half of the lineups in your pool are probably going to have pretty similar expected value, I would say it's kind of a, a, a fine line there. You can get this additional diversity in your pool while sacrificing very little by way of, of EV. I mean, on a very practical level, Max, like how have you actually been setting your min uniques players or, or thinking about this when it comes to your lineup portfolio? Well, I, I, you know, it's something I'm certainly going to be using this year, but yeah. before, you know, I was just sort of doing it with my own min and max exposures. Right. Um, but I think this is also, I mean, it's, I think it's great to play around with because it can kind of show you, um, you know, how important a player is to your lineups. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to get diversity, right. Cause you can see like three men, unique players. That's a lot. That's three different players have to, three players have to be different in every lineup. Right. And we're still getting 84% Nikola Jokic. You know, that says to me that he's a really important player yeah. and it gives me a really good baseline of, okay, like what should my exposure maximum be where before we had this, I was kind of flying blind and I didn't want to set right. admin unique players high pre-build because of what I was just talking about. So I think it's fun to at least, experiment around with because then you can see okay like which players truly are important or which players actually are kind of replaceable and if you do min unique you know you can lower their exposure quite a bit yeah and, and tb tom says uh if i like the min uniques to be set at four for smaller slates would i do the same for bigger slates like tonight or increase or decrease that number um i would say bigger slate you can increase the number four is a lot four is a is a is a big number I would say if you're doing four for a two game slate, that might be a little too much. I could be wrong. Um, but I think for a 12 game slate, it's perfectly viable. But I would say, you know, the more players you can choose from, the more min uniques you can have. If you're obviously, if you're doing like a showdown slate, having four min unique would be actually impossible. Um, maybe it's possible, but maybe it's not. So you kind of want to lower it as the slate gets smaller and raise it as the slate gets bigger. 
and I'll, I'll add on a couple things, you know, I think probably one of the most important things there is that's going to depend a ton on how many lineups you are actually playing. Like if you're playing five lineups, you could probably, and you can, I think the best way to use min uniques is to actually do this yourself and watch this. But I mean, three min uniques for five lineups only takes us to lineup 16 of 1500. We could increase min uniques here to six if we wanted to get that diversified. And we still have five lineups in the pool that fit that. Uh, Whereas when we were at, you know, 150 lineups, we couldn't even get to four min uniques without running out of lineups in the pool. So it's going to depend on slate. It's going to depend on how many lineups you're playing. I would, I would, instead of thinking again about a heuristic of what you're trying to do every time, start at one and study the impact that that has on your actual lineup set as you increase it one by one up to kind of whatever feels like an appropriate value there. Um, uh, Michael said, uh, in regards to using late swap, is there a quicker way to... Okay, so to get a late swap started, I, there was a question about this last night that I answered. So we changed this. This is new for from last year. You can just initiate a late swap now just by clicking new build once the slate has started. So if if you click new build and the slate has started, this toggle will already be on. It's warning me that the slate hasn't started in this particular case. That's okay. It will look like this. And you'll probably have an entries file already loaded if you use the entry editor to get your lineups in. And so begins your late swap. So you don't need to go to the entry editor anymore. You don't need to go anywhere else. You can initiate a late swap from any time, from anywhere on the app, just by starting a new build once the slate has begun. Cool stuff. Um, Dante says, Max, are you ever manually adjusting player ownership in step one to cap exposure or just lowering exposure in step three? Uh, also, when giving manual bumps to a player up or down, is there a max or min number to to go to? Yeah. Um, so Jordan said earlier with point projection, 10%, that's a great baseline. Doing more than 10% is probably more than uh, too much. With ownership projection, um, I think you can go both ways, right? You know, if you change someone's ownership projection, um, that's going to change how ownership fate is t- taken into account. So it's helpful to do that if you really think that our ownership projection is wrong um, for one reason or another. Um, and you can also do just sort of think about what kind of leverage you want on a player and, mm-hmm. and change their min or max exposure. Um, you know, changing ownership is something I do, but I, you know, I've been playing DFS for eight years. So I sort of have an intuitive sense of what players might get over or under owned. Um, usually youth is a big factor and matchup is a big factor. Um, uh, narrative as well. Um, you know, sometimes when there's a quote unquote revenge game, someone will get overowned. And um, who knows if that actually matters or not, but uh, it certainly raises the ownership of the player. So um, you definitely can adjust them. I do sometimes do it. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'll do both, I'll do a pre and post build. Cool. Braden says, any tips for turbo slates for like 50 people? Um, I actually think that the 50 person contest size is a bigger impact than like it being a turbo for this question. But I mean, do you play any of the turbos or the, the night slates or, or any, any smaller slates? Any reason, I um, guess real quickly yeah. would the strategy, cause we talked about small slate strategy already in the stream here today. So um, we can, you can rewind and watch some of that, but is there any reason that you think turbos or night slates on a, on a bigger main slate night is different than what you would be doing just on a smaller slate in general. Does that make sense? Cause I think that's kind it, of, yeah. The, the only reason it's different is like a turbo. If I understand correctly, cause I don't actually play them. I do play late, but turbo I think means that they all have the same start time. Yes. Um, so there's no late swap, right? So can making late swap considerations, it's not a thing. Um, and I'm sure that's why some people like them is cause it's you sort of set and forget it. Um, so that would be the only consideration is on a main slate, you know, your, you know, sometimes you'll have five game slate where they're all span different times and there's a lot of strategy with late swap to keep in mind, but with the turbo, you don't have to keep that in mind at all. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you are looking for, if you think you've got maybe an ownership angle or some kind of other, I guess, particularly an ownership angle on a, uh, on a turbo slate, I would lean into that a little more because you're not going to have the the late swap edge to to fall back on, right? Like if you if you think you've got an exploitative ownership based angle on a slate where all the games start at the same time, that that's going to be probably your biggest edge because the, the slate all starts at the same time. So, yeah. yeah. Um, covered uh, this kind of similar earlier with the Geomean question here. Um, 
Max, I, I mean, any final thoughts on like ownership cap rules or, or some rules or anything like that? I didn't do it. Okay. Yeah, me either. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think, again, you know, I'll, I'll reiterate one more time, uh, broken record here is build lineups first and see what you need to do, right? Are you getting lineups right. that look like they are too highly owned for you? Then maybe there's a, a fair reason to set the rule. Um, but the, the rule does not need to, to come first here. So, yeah. Um, question from Patrick here. If playing multiple contests with the volatility of news drops, is there a preference on build selection when you want to do one build? Yeah, I mean, I sort of just try to split the middle. Um, there's the, I mean, he has a good point, which is basically it's like your build settings um you know technically for different contests but when you have a late swap it's like you know it's kind of just the easiest thing to do and the thing i do is kind of just split the middle and just do something that is like that um so and you have to keep in mind like when is the news dropping right and what is this person's ownership projection usually when i'm doing a late swap i'm lowering ownership fade because the ownership projection is going to be way more difficult to have be accurate. Um, so that's something you keep in mind, but usually you're just going to try to do something that's in the middle of all your contests and worry more about just getting in the players that you want to get in. And that's, that's the big point. I think there is like the edge you're getting from late swapping and reacting to that news is far outweighing anything that you're sacrificing of using like sliders that are slightly suboptimal for the, the contest that you're building them for. Uh, I do the exact same thing as Max, right? I group all my late swap together and, and just run it all in one build. Yeah. Interesting question from Billy. I've actually been talking uh, to Matt on the team about this a lot. Um, said, if I run a multiple lineup build before lock with three uniques and then news breaks before late games and I late swap, I would lose those uniques. Uh, should I even use uniques? This is true. I mean, at the moment, there is no way to set min uniques in a late swap build because each lineup is only getting rebuilt once. I, I have some thoughts here, but Max, I mean, your, your thoughts on like the kind of push and pull there of, of you get min uniques before the build with the pool and you have to kind of sacrifice them as you're late swapping. Yeah. I mean, God, it just depends on the slate, right? Cause there's going to be some slates where late swap probably is not going to take, uh, you're not going to use it. And some slates where you're definitely going to. Um, and so as I said, it's like you, you, you can like have the build that you want with the uniques that you want and blah, blah, blah. And then, you're probably going to have to change it eventually. Um, and you're going to lose sort of all of that. Um, so I think, you know, I, when you're building your early lineups, I think it's just keep good to keep in mind, like positioning, like which players are you getting a lot of and are, is there flexibility there? Are you going to be able to change them later? Do they, are they in a position that's more flexible, you know? So, um, yeah, I think you don't really have to use uniques, but that being said, getting that diversity might give you more opportunity later. So it's kind of just a mixed bag. Yeah, and you know, I think, <clears throat> I mean, just a couple of notes. One, on, on the product side, we're aware of this kind of weird problem, I guess, uh, and, and, and are looking for ways to kind of create opportunities to get minimum unique numbers of players, even when late swapping. In the meantime... Uh, and, and this kind of gets into the, the technical side of things a little bit. You actually almost don't lose any diversity when running your late swap build because each lineup is only rebuilt one time anyway. Like part of the reason why min uniques is useful before the build is because we're building 1500 lineups, then sorting by the top 20 or 150. And that can float a lot of the same kinds of constructions up to the top sorted by Saber score. Post build, since each lineup is only rebuilt once in a late swap build, those lineups kind of naturally get some additional diversity that way. So uh, Billy, kind of a technical answer for you there, I would say on, on a more practical level for at least for me is if you are stuck between should I late swap because news broke or and or sacrifice my min, min uniques that I set before the build, you're almost always going to be in a better position having run the late swap than not because that news is right. so impactful and projections change so much. I, I wouldn't, I would never think like, oh, big news broke. The projections have changed, but I don't want to sacrifice my pre-lock diversity as a way of actually kind of making the decisions there. So, um, but good question there. Uh, DT uh, 
on limiting too many studs in a lineup from the same team, do you use a proxy like salary or something else for how you would define a stud? Interesting question here. Uh, whoops. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I'm not sure one of us is having internet issues here now. Um, I'm not sure it might be me. I, I can't really tell. Um, uh oh. Yeah. I oh, no. Okay. Uh, I it, it, the the chat says Max is frozen. I, it says my internet's not great either. So I'm going to assume that it is that I can that people can hear me. Um, okay. Yeah. So we lost Max here. So I'll, I'll go ahead and answer this, and and hopefully we we get Max back here in in just a minute. Um, you know, I again, I I, I would say at, like at best you're going to be using kind of a a heuristic here that like you know has limitations. I have kind of, when I've experimented with this rule briefly, I've been using projection as a proxy and basically saying that like two players, two plus players from the same team projected for over 40 points is where I kind of like start to at least have some question marks, right? That would account for things like Durant and Kyrie Irving. Um, that would account for things like DeWante Murray and uh, Trey Young, um, that kind of stuff. So th- that's my proxy there, so to speak. Um, I just keep in mind that again, you're you're limited there by missing context, missing nuance, uh, that kind of stuff. So it looks like we have Max uh, back here. So tethering with my phone now. So cool, perfect. Hopefully this is better. Yeah, yeah. It it, are, it seems like it's a little better already. So uh, CG said, uh, "How far away from the default build do you run with NBA? Let's say in a 150 max." How, what, what do you think he means by this? How far? So what I think, what I think this is asking is like, just how many adjustments do you make? Or like, do you like how, how far off of what you are getting by default do you go? I I think Max, I think this is probably a weird question for you because you're making so many adjustments. (laughs) Yeah. It's very, very far. Yeah. Right. So you're, here's the thing is, is you want to make as many of adjustments from the default build as they're going to improve your build. So there are many ways to do that, as we've talked about on the stream. So that could be focusing on a few players. That could be focusing on a lot of players. Um, so if that's the question, it, it just it depends on the day. It depends on the slate. It depends on how many adjustments I'm making. But I'm just trying to do as much as I can where I'm improving the pool of lineups I get, improving the lineups that I choose that I get. And if you are unsure of ways to add value or you are learning MBA for the first time and 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 aren't really sure what make adjustments to make, there there's no tool that is going to put you in a better position to succeed right out of the gate than Saber Sim. So like even for me, you know, there are going to be slates where I add very little value. I make almost no adjustments if I think that what I'm getting looks pretty good by default. And I, I think that's okay. You don't you shouldn't feel like you need to do things just to say that you did, um, especially with NBA, just because sometimes it's you know, sometimes you're mostly playing the best place. So, um, metal alloy asks, do you ever fully ex- exclude teams or games in step one before you build? You had, you had touched on earlier before eliminating teams playing in early games for late swap flexibility. Is, is there any other reasons that you would eliminate teams or games completely? Uh, no, I, I mean, and I don't do that anymore because of that was before there was even a late swap tool that existed. Right. So, um, now that we have a really good late swap tool, so you don't need to do that with any, there's there's no reason to do that unless, you know, very, very occasionally there will be some weird news like a leak in a stadium or something like that, or like something where the game, there's actually a threat that it's going to get canceled. It's very rare. But if you see a rumor like that, sometimes I will actually just straight up exclude those teams. Cool. Yeah, it's it's not something that I do too much. Um, I would feel, you know, I would say, you know, be very be very confident if you're going to do that. Um, because I think that's a, a pretty like aggressive and, and and a risky stance to just take crossing out a, a, a whole game there. Um Skull says, would you say that rules are more important in NBA than NFL when using Saber Sim? Uh 
your thoughts? Um, I would say they're less important because, you know, stuff like stacking and trying to correlate is just less important. So you're kind of just trying to play the best high upside plays. Um, and it's just like, there, there's just not a specific rule that's going to make your lineup construction that much better than another lineup construction. Yeah, agreed. I would say less, less important by probably a lot. Um, just for for exactly that reason, I, I, I don't think there's a descriptive like you should always have this uh, in NBA like there is in in even baseball, um, but but definitely football. So, um, Tom said, uh, is there an ideal exposure percentage for I- diversification? to make the Saberson profit plan work as efficiently as possible with 20 lineups being the example. You want to try to answer that one? I, I, mean, I, I, mean, sure. and, and I would say I, and I'm real, really starting to feel like a broken record again. Now I, I think there is not going to be a rule of thumb or an ideal exposure of what you want because it's going like, if there was, it would miss the nuance or context of what that particular slate looks like, uh, what the contest you're playing looks like, how well you said how many lineups you're playing, but how many games are on the slate. I mean, there are there are going to be slates this year because of how well projected certain players can get based on their salary, where a hundred percent exposure across twenty lineups to like maybe even two or three players might be the optimal approach if there are a ton of like really good players rolled out. There are also slates where there's going to be pretty dry on value and maybe you know. Being having fifty percent or sixty percent exposure to a player might be overexposure, depending on on what the slate looks like. Um, my favorite tool for for diversification now is this Min Uniques players, and what I'm doing in most of my builds is basically once I have made all the other adjustments I want to make here, whether that's you know limiting some stack types or limiting player exposure or xing players out or whatever, I am basically trying to get as much diversity by way of Min Uniques while not extending too deep into the pool is, is my general philosophy. Um, and, and that's kind of like as specific as I can get before you start to run into situations where you need to think about the slate and that, the, the context of the slate that way. So I don't know. I, I, I hope that's somewhat of a helpful answer here. I realize there's a lot of gray area there, but there, there, I guess thinking about the question in the most literal way possible, is there an ideal exposure percentage for diversification? The answer to that question is no. Uh, from my perspective, because it does need a lot of additional nuance. So, um, all right, we are close to the bottom of the chat here. Um, appreciate everybody being here, hanging out with us, asking questions here. Um, one more here from Metal Alloy. Since NBA is so heavily driven by projections and some of the chalk is usually good chalk, what is the best way to ensure that you include some low-owned players or does the sim automatically do that? Uh, we've touched on this uh, a couple times here. It does, in some sense, you know, actually, like in a very good sense, account for ownership by way of our ownership fade slider, which does adjust on a per contest basis. So, based on the size of the contest you're playing, you are getting a different, you are accounting for ownership differently in your lineup builds. Um, that said, run your lineups. Take the time to study the ownerships you are getting in your lineups, and and you know, make adjustments there as you see fit. Um, a lot of questions on ownership today, Max. Any any other thoughts that you wanted to add on there? Yeah, it it never hurts to also just make a min exposure of three to five percent on some players that you don't think are going to be owned very much, but mm-hmm. um, you like for a particular reason and want to get in your lineups. And you can even kind of like check that, you know, if you're looking here, like, hey, Kyrie looks like he could be pretty low owned. You can, you know, within a build, you can kind of see, you know, how much Kyrie am I getting in my pool in twenty lineups? Do I want to, you know, sprinkle? 5% exposure. Um, in this case, I wasn't able to get there probably because of my other min uniques I've set and things like that. But um, you can kind of do that on a per player basis that way. So, yep. Um, a lot of questions about this in the past 24 hours as well. I, I would say, you know, sorting by saver score is almost always going to be better than sorting by projected score just because saver score captures correlations, it captures uh, ownership and things like that. Um, so I would. I would recommend sticking to Saber score. It is it is default uh, for a reason. Um, the min projection rule definitely can be useful. We've talked about that a little bit as well during this stream here. Um, 
you can uh, make that uh, bigger or smaller here um, by clicking the, the filter here. Um, and Max, you had mentioned that, you know, increasing that a bit on larger slates, decreasing a bit on smaller slates is something that you like to do. Yeah, I mean, you you don't really have to worry about it that much. Um, we also just improved the way that we built lineups. So I think that you're going to probably see some, and the way we improved it, it makes it so you're not going to see as many of this like kind of stranger one-off low uh, projected players. So I, I just won't even worry about it. But, you know, if you really want to make sure that they don't sneak in, um, it's, it's definitely good to raise it. Cool. Um, a couple other questions here. Michael said, if I only want three players max from any team, um, you can do that with a simple stack rule in the lineup rules section here. Um, add a rule, stack rule, no more than three players from the primary team. You can pick what teams it applies to, anything like that. So, uh, JJ said, if I build 20 lineups and Saberson wants me to have a hundred percent of one player and 90% of another, how would you handle this? Um, well, I think the, I think we sort of went over it a little bit. It's yeah. right. Is, is, you know, in NBA, you, you gotta be okay a little bit with having high exposure to a particular player. Um, and especially with late swapping, sometimes you actually really, really want that. Um, so I would play around with min uniques and just see how those players are differing as you raise the min unique. And if they're still in your lineups doing like form and unique, then I would just say I'd handle it by getting that player a hundred percent of the time. Um, if you know, you see it spread out, but you don't want to use that min unique, you can then sort of cap their exposure, their max exposure. And I think that's fine, but you know, usually I'm getting maybe on a 12 game slate isn't, isn't true, but usually I'm getting a player like 90 plus percent of the time. Yeah, I think you have to be willing to accept that in 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 this particular sport, just because players are that are projected well are so likely to achieve that projection. Um, so I I agree. Um, I do see you know there are still some more questions coming in here. I think we are um, you know getting some some repetition here. I we've been doing it here for uh, a, over an hour and a half now, and we've covered a lot of these already. So I would say for for folks that are maybe just tuning in now, um, I would rewind. Uh, watch some of this back over. We've covered a lot of these questions here already. So um, I think we'll go ahead and start to wrap up. Um, I do want to mention, we have a ton of people watching us here today. Um, so thank you everybody for tuning in. If you haven't checked out Sabersim already, uh, we have a totally free seven-day trial on our site, sabersim.com. You can go get signed up right now. Try us out for the 12-game slate here tonight. If you had a trial in the past, we recently reset everybody's trial access. You can come check it out. Check out the new build speed in particular. We've done a couple builds on stream here today. It is super fast. There's a lot of people in chat talking about it as well. Really, uh, I think a legitimate feature in a sport like NBA. Um, so we'll, we'll start to wrap up here. Max, I, I think final thoughts, um, maybe anything that you would give to somebody that is trying out NBA DFS for the first time this season. One thing you want to leave them with of something that they can kind of look into or, or make a part of their process. Yeah, I think I'll just circle back to what I, I've been trying to emphasize from the, the start of this video. It's just basically like, say, like your philosophy should be Sabersim. You're using Sabersim because we're helping you out, right? We're helping you out more than a traditional optimizer where we're, we're raising the floor of the builds that you're getting because we're using the simulation data. You can basically do whatever you want. You can set any rule you want. You can set min exposures. You have a lot of control. Um, and what you want to do is some people can get overwhelmed by that, right? They think, oh my God, I have to analyze every team. I have to change every exposure, blah, blah, blah. Your philosophy should be what are some easy way, what are the easiest ways I can add value by like looking at a news article, listening to a podcast, looking on Twitter, watching, getting a coach's quote, something like that, looking at some previous games. Find the easiest way for you to do that or taking to a late swap as we've been harping on as well. Find the easiest ways to do that. Focus on that. If you have more time, get more and more complex. But basically, you know, if you make just a few good changes to what we're giving you, um, whether that's taking into news or positioning better for late swap, um, you're probably going to do pretty well. So I would just focus on those simple things that are easy that can really change your lineups for the better and you're probably going to do well. Great. 
And if you are still watching and you still have questions or we didn't get to your questions or you have follow-up questions from our answers to your questions, uh, two resources for you. One, our Discord server. There's a link to join Discord in the description of this video. Once you join, you can link your SaberSim account. There are a ton of really sharp guys in there talking strategy, answering questions every single day. I'm in there as well. Max is in there. Join the Discord server. Ask any questions you have there. Also, we still have office hours today. So our coach, Andrew, will be going live at 5 o'clock Eastern for office hours here today, answering more questions, talking NBA strategy, whatever you guys want to talk about. So if you watched us, if you hung out with us here for the past uh, hour and 45 minutes or so and, and still want to talk some more, uh, Andrew will be on doing another live stream at, at 5 o'clock Eastern. So um, Max, this was fun. Honestly, it flew by. I didn't expect for us yeah. to uh, to get almost to, to two hours here. Um, appreciate you, you joining and hanging out with me here today. And uh, good luck tonight and good luck this season. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. See ya.